I am Burl Nelson. I am the younger brother of Marjorie Nelson. Uh, we grew up in Kokomo and, well, our parents grew up in Fillion, Michigan. They both attained teaching certificates and taught in Huron County. However, at the time of the Depression, there was no money to be made teaching. They moved to Detroit and my father took a job in the auto industry. In the 1930s, he was working for Chrysler and they were building the new factory in Kokomo and would give him an advance in pay and position if he moved down there to help start the factory. His plan was only to be in Kokomo for a short period of time and then move back to Michigan. However, World War II came along and he could not quit his job at the factory. Then my mother developed multiple sclerosis and the health plan benefits that my father received at Chrysler meant that he could not afford to change jobs. They, as many people do, when they moved, they went church shopping. Uh, they attended and became involved with the local Quakers and became members of Cortland Avenue Friends Church. Marjorie and I had our early church experience and learning at Cortland Avenue. Marjorie helped care for our mother as mom's multiple sclerosis progressed. This experience fostered an interest in studying nursing. She was very surprised when a member of our church told her that she could become a doctor. As a girl in the 1950s, she thought that doctors were all men. Margie and I both became involved with the traditional silent worship Quakers later. How did Marjorie end up in Vietnam? My sister was aware of missionary work. And Indiana University created a custom plan for her internship, which they called missionary medicine. And she served her internship on board the hospital ship Hope in Africa. Then she did her residency training in Philadelphia. While visiting Marjorie in Philadelphia, I became more aware of her involvement with American Friends Service Committee. She took me to a presentation by another Quaker organization called AQUAG, a Quaker action group who organized the humanitarian protest voyages of the 50-foot sailboat Phoenix to North and South Vietnam. This was in the mid-1960s, and we were both led by our Quaker beliefs to undertake humanitarian actions, which also were an expression of our opposition to the American war in Vietnam. Our goal was to bring assistance to innocent Vietnamese who were suffering due to the actions of the U.S. military. At that time, Quakers were the only Americans who were directly communicating with the Vietnamese who were called the enemy by the United States. As Quakers, we believed strongly that we had no enemies and wished to live up to our Christian teaching to love enemies. Marjorie actually spent two months or a bit more as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. She was captured about the 9th of February while she was visiting a friend of hers in Hue, the old provincial capital. It's a beautiful city. It turned out that 1968, the Tet Offensive took place when the forces of the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese Army and the NLF took over Hue. And as part of her training with AFSC, she had learned to speak Vietnamese. And so they heard the, the, the gunfire and the bombs and everything, and eventually people came and knocked on the door and said, open up. And she was able to talk to them in Vietnamese. And I'm reading from a, an article about her experience. We were told in English that we were going to be taken to the mountains and that when there was peace, we'd be returned to our families. I therefore assumed we were in for a long stay. We left that night and walked most of the night before resting for a few hours at a small village in the hills. The next morning, we set out again after breakfast and walked until late afternoon in a jungle to a jungle camp on a mountainside. I was so exhausted after this long trek that I didn't move much for the next two days. 
When taken prisoner by the NLF in the Tet Offensive, I experienced good treatment and tender concern by the, quote, enemy, unquote. When I fell ill with dysentery, a North Vietnamese doctor walked for several hours through the mountains to my camp to treat me. The soldiers collected from their meager belongings such things as powdered eggs, a little sugar, and a can of sweetened condensed milk that they gave me to help you regain your strength. The, the cook of the camp started rising at 4 a.m. to catch small fish in the stream to supplement my rice and vegetable diet. No one else in the camp had meat. Never in my life have I been more uplifted. We were told about the middle of March that we were going to be released as soon as arrangements could be made. We were also told that the soldiers were making us souvenirs, combs made out of aluminum taken from napalm canisters to take with us. In addition to her medical degree, Marjorie had a master's degree in public health. Also, she raised a son as a single mother while being the only female professor at Ohio University Medical School in Athens, Ohio. She held many positions with various Quaker organizations, too numerous for me to remember, but I do know that she was the Quaker representative at the UN for, I think, a period of one year. So. Both Margie and I attended Earlham College, a Quaker college in Richmond, Indiana. I would say it was the bedrock of our, of our lives. It influenced the way that we, uh, the way we thought about things and motivated us to do things that I'm certain we wouldn't have done if we hadn't had the, the Quaker upbringing. Now, she started attending the Quaker silent meeting worship and then the same thing was true at Earlham College. So both of us were exposed to what I, I call the traditional silent meeting Quakers later on in life. But it, uh, it, it really was the thread that ran through both of our lives, I would say. How do you think Marjorie would feel knowing she's being inducted into the Hall of Legends? So I think she would be very, very impressed and very, very thankful for the people that took the time to bestow this honor.